Well, I, I hope the applause at the end of my talk is uh, halfway as, as warm as the one at the beginning. Thank you very much. And uh, now that I've got all the paraphernalia out of my pockets, I'll begin. Well, thank you, Charlie, and, and uh, all my colleagues at Texas A&M for inviting me here. And I came a few days early. I've been uh, wandering around the USDA research facilities, bothering the heck out of my colleagues there. Thanks for uh, the, their patience with me. Without further ado, I'll, uh, I'll uh, begin the uh, consideration of where we are with uh, horticulture genetic resources and, and some idea about where we're headed. Let's see. There we go. So the outline is going to be quite simple. Uh, a, a short introduction to horticultural genetic resources, where we are now, the current status, and where we may be headed. And I'll try to, to leave a few minutes at the end for uh, some uh, Ta uh, some questions and discussion. So some definitions, plant genetic resources, wh what are they? For the purpose of this talk and really the purpose uh, for, for what uh, we focus on, it's the means by which plants perpetuate. It's seeds, it's uh, uh, bulbs, cuttings, organs of reproduction. Note that I didn't mention here DNA or, or, or molecules. We're not yet in the business of preserving and, uh, and distributing DNA on a, uh, a wide-scale basis. If I gave a talk like this five to ten years from now, uh, it, it very well may be included. The particular focus today is on horticultural genetic resources, th these plant materials that have some actual or potential utility uh, to, to horticulture. And given this is the Ellison Lecture, I'll often use uh, reference to floriculture and nursery examples to, uh, to demonstrate the point. So uh, a, a nice example of, uh, of horticulture and genetic resources is this liner of, uh, of uh, birch uh, shown, shown here. I could show any, uh, any number of shots of, of uh, seeds or, or uh, plants and orchards. This is horticultural genetic resources. We can categorize it in a variety of ways. Uh, firstly, uh, by how it's uh, adapted, where it originated. Uh, is, it, uh, is it from the tropics? Is it from the subarctic? It's genetic profile. And what I mean by that is uh, when you assay it genetically, is it completely homogeneous and homozygous, no genetic variability? Is it highly variable, uh, heterozygous, the way we are? and heterogeneous the, the way we are, or uh, we have some clonely propagating materials that are heterozygous, but yet they're homogeneous. So there's a variety of ways of, of, uh, of uh, profiling materials genetically, and it's very important for management applications. Breeding systems are very important. Is it outcrossing? Is it inbreeding? Is it clonely propagated? Very important for what we do. Is it a, a short-lived herbaceous uh, herb, uh, uh, herbaceous plant? Is it a long-lived tree? Uh, other aspects that are extremely important. Intensity of human selection I'll go into in, in some detail. And how is it being used? Is it used as a landscape plant? Is it used as a bedding plant? Is it a medicinal? Does it have several uses? So... Uh, one of the ways of characterizing it, again, is by intensity of human selection. Some of the materials that we manage as genetic resources are wild plants that haven't been selected deliberately by humans. Some are weedy plants. They're adapted to disturbed uh, environments, oftentimes sun-loving. Some have been selected and maintained by traditional populations over thousands of years. The land races are traditional cultivars. Some are enhanced germplasm that have been bred, but not to the extent that we consider them finished varieties. Some are materials that 10, 20, 30 years ago were leading edge. The leading edge of pansy variety in 1950 would now be considered an old cultivar. May not be of commercial use now, but may have some genes that have some utility. Elite cultivars, this is the commercial uh, material that's at the leading edge, uh, the, 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 the brand new petunia variety that everyone is clamoring to, to buy. And finally, genetic stocks. These are materials that we maintain more as research tools, 
than as the source of, of genes for crop improvement. They help us understand better how the genetic composition, uh, the genetic architecture of, of particular plants is, is uh, organized. So about 30 years ago, uh, when I was a student in Mexico, I, I took the shot of uh, some traditional Mexican farmers growing highly heterogeneous heterozygous uh, potato varieties in central Mexico. Uh, you contrast that with uh, a shot that at least someone in this audience will recognize of a, of a, a production field uh, in the southeastern U.S. Uh, of uh, some ornamental plants. Uh, you don't see as much variability in this shot as, as you would see in a traditional farmer's field. So that's a brief introduction to horticultural genetic resources. Now a bit about a, a very uh, panoramic, I hope, view of their current status and how we're managing them. Here's some characteristics of, of plant genetic resource management. Uh, there's uh, some misconception, I think, uh, in perhaps in the popular media and perhaps even among scientists, that our job is to safeguard the materials, essentially put it in the can in the cold so that it's safe forever, more, more the, uh, in the way that a bullion is deposited in Fort Knox. That's what we're, that's not all what we're about. Not only are these materials conserved, but we encourage their use. We have to take a long-term focus. Uh, we don't, our aim is not to manage these materials, conserve them for a week, a month, a year. It's indefinite. Especially in horticulture and in ornamentals, we deal with a huge variety of different taxa, a huge variety of life forms from uh, again, ephemeral herbs to long-lived uh, uh, landscape trees with an incredibly broad distribution. As you'll see, the operation of genetic resource management is very complicated. It's multi-phase. It, it's spread out through uh, space and time. And there's uh, two major types or two major approaches to uh, genetic resource management. One. Uh, dynamic or in situ conservation that I'll talk about first. And then secondly, the, the topic of most of the discussion will be ex situ static approaches in gene banks. And ideally, these are complementary approaches. So what do I mean by dynamic conservation or in situ? It's conserving the materials where they originated. So on your left is a hillside in uh, Bo Bozeman, Montana in the state park. So this material is being conserved uh, on site. Uh, and what's important here is that evolution goes on. You have natural selection on these materials. You have disease resistance that uh, presumably evolves, insect resistance. Uh, and uh, some of these materials uh, may have uh, utility at some point for, uh, for uh, ornamental production, perhaps. Another example would be this uh, stewardia in a, uh, a state park in Tennessee. It's, uh, the, the, the landscape is being conserved. Evolution continues. And, and if you were to sample the, uh, this, po this population, let's say in a 50-year, 100-year period, you'd probably see uh, quite a few differences. Meadow foam, uh, so-called because if you look at planting, uh, not plantings, uh, populations of it, in these vernal pools in California. It looks like a layer of foam on top of the green uh, vernal pool. These are also being conserved in situ uh, so that evolution can continue to occur. But, but these slides really show some of the dangers of in, of in situ conservation. You can see the border of this town that's growing, uh, a road running by this, uh, this preserve with uh, uh, D development. So you, you have the danger of uh, habitat degradation, habitat dis uh, destruction if you try to rely solely on in situ conservation. So it's very important that we have these materials maintained in gene banks. So here we have a, a wild hydrangea uh, species and, and some cultivated materials. And we refer to this as static conservation. Because unlike uh, in situ conservation, the goal is for evolution not to happen. It's, it's to conserve a genetic snapshot of 
what these materials were like when they were acquired and put into the gene bank to maintain them true to type. So it's to conserve the materials but not to conserve the evolutionary processes. Should be complementary, these two types. So what sort of organizations would conduct uh, the, this, this ex situ gene bank conservation? The first I'll mention is non-governmental organizations. And there's a huge variety of these. You can find this on the web. Uh, seemingly, seemingly every week there's a new one. They oftentimes focus on heirloom seeds. The quality of their uh, conservation activities is highly variable. Their policies are highly variable, even within organizations. So these shots are of uh, really the, the, uh, one of the uh, finest facilities of its type at Kew Gardens, south of the main uh, park of Kew Gardens. Uh, the, the so-called Millennium Gene Bank, where there's a uh, first-rate, brand-new uh, uh, storage facilities, research facilities. And uh, another part of Kew Gardens uh, is, uh, dates back to the Victorian times, where you have materials that are conserved in these, these glass houses that were, were built in the middle of the 19th century. So within one organization, uh, a large organization, there's quite a bit of variability in policy and capability. Another uh, uh, group of organizations that participate or, or conduct plant genetic resource management is the private sector. Uh, oftentimes, major uh, seed companies have large inventories of materials that are, are elite or pre-commercial. And uh, oftentimes, they're more sharply focused than what you would, you would see in a, a, non, a gene bank run by a non-governmental organization. So here's the shot of, the, uh, of the, uh, one of the seed rooms at the Ball Horticultural Company outside of Chicago, showing at least part of their inventory, very well organized, focused on commercial and pre-commercial materials. Sometimes, and, right, and uh, quite understandably, uh, the information about the genetic resources is closely held. This is a business. That's, that's completely understandable. It's interestingly, on a gene-by-gene -gene basis, the materials managed by the private sector may not be as variable as what you would find in public gene banks. But the genotypic diversity, the different types of cultivars, may be much greater within a, a given species. Well, finally, uh, some of the major players in horticultural genetic resource management are, uh, are national and international gene banks. These are mainly supported by governments or international organizations. They contain, on a, a numerical basis, most of the genetic, uh, genetic resources in the world. An estimate of the total number is about 1.5 million unique samples. It's important to say unique. Because if you, if you do a count across all the gene banks you can find on the web, and, and our colleagues at the, at the Global Crop Diversity Trust in, uh, in Rome have done that, they've counted 6 million. But when they, you look carefully at it, it's thought that these gene banks have been trading materials back and forth for years. And it's likely that only about 25% of that total of 6 million is really non-redundant. So that's the, really the group to focus on. And as with the, the private sector and NGOs, the quality of conservation, the policies is highly variable. So uh, you have two examples. This is a, a, a grow out of some of our allium, garlic, or, ornamental allium, uh, uh, onion production in uh, one of our gene banks in the state of Washington. You see here uh, some insect-proof cages so that these will be placed over the allium and flies would be inserted to do the pollination. Another example, would this is the gene bank of the Chinese Academy of Agricultural Science in uh, Beijing, a very large gene bank, well-maintained, well-supported by the Chinese government. For those of you who... Uh, are familiar with uh, the local media or tie into the local media. At the end of February, there was quite a bit of publicity about a new seed vault that was uh, opened 
on the, uh, sub the Arctic subarctic island of Svalbard, which is owned by Norway. One of our scientists was, was up there for the opening ceremony. The U.S. has contributed money to uh, constructing this. It was primarily constructed by funding from the government of Norway. International donors uh, are, are going to be running it. And what it is, it's a tunnel that's, that's bored into uh, a mountain beneath the, the permafrost. And uh, seeds that are considered to be critical for human survival, the major uh, food crops, are going to be put in there and uh, safeguarded, hopefully, uh, in perpetuity. And this shows you some shots of the, uh, of the local surroundings. The, the sun was just coming up for a, for a few, uh, few minutes or a few hours uh, each day there in, in Svalbard. Well, the, the series of gene banks I know most about are those in the U.S. National Planet Germplasm System. Uh, and uh, this is a network of gene banks that's, uh, that's administered and led by the USDA Agricultural Research Service in very strong partnership with the Land Grape Grant University community and the, and the private sector in the United States. This is something that USDA ARS could not do on its own. Uh, and uh, I'll be making reference to some local uh, uh, entities here in College Station that are participants in this. It's one of the largest national gene banks in the world. Uh, I'd say in about two years or so, we're going to top 500,000 samples, more than 12,000 species. The focus is on the major staples of importance to U.S. agriculture. So fully a quarter of that 484,000 are grain crops, uh, wheat, barley, oats, rice, sorghum, maize. However, we, uh, the National Plant Germplasm System really stands apart from a lot of national gene banks is that we have collections of, of crops for which there aren't major collections in international agricultural research centers. So our cotton collection, which is housed just north of here in the USDA facility on F&B Road, is the best of its type in the world. Uh, the soybean collection that we maintain in Urbana, Illinois, is the best Illinois, the best of type in, it, in, in the world. And a lot of our horticultural collections I'll talk about in a bit are, are really world class. To learn more about this, we have one of the, the, the better, if not the best, uh, information systems for managing the material, the GRIN system, Germplasm Resources Information Network, and it's become an international standard. Uh, here's a, a map of our gene banks. Clearly, there was a major tectonic event that shrank the size of Alaska and, and uh, moved it offshore to Oregon. So, for, so those of you who plan to travel to Alaska, it's much closer than it once was. Uh, on a serious note, uh, there's more than 20 gene banks. Uh, are the the uh, large uh, uh, lo long-term cold storage high security facilities at, at Fort Collins here in College Station, we have collections, uh, three uh, important collections. As I mentioned, the U.S. cotton collection is here. The U.S. pecan collection is, is here. And also we have some sorghum genetic stocks. And some, and some of the science, era scientists here in the audience have uh, responsibility for this nationally. For those of you uh, focused on floricultural nursery crops, the, the gene banks most important to you is the Ornamental Plant Germplasm Center on the Ohio State campus uh, in uh, Columbus, Ohio, and the Woody Landscape Plant Crop Germplasm uh, effort that's at the U.S. National Arboretum in Washington, D.C. And there are, are uh, ornamentals in other locations such as Ames, Iowa, Corvallis, Oregon. Here's a shot of uh, some representative gene, uh, gene banks. This is the, uh, the date palm gene bank in the uh, Imperial Valley in California on uh, University of California land. It's jointly maintained by UC and USDA RS. Uh, uh, for parts of California, date palm production is very important, not only for the fruit, but once these trees cease bearing, they're then sold as ornamental palms at, at a quite a price, actually, something like 
what is it, $1,000 a foot? So a 30-foot high palm would sell for $30,000. So these uh, day palm farmers are doing fine, thank you. And probably worrying about the, the red palm, I thought. Uh, here's a, a grow out site for one of our gene banks in Washington State. It's uh, right uh, on, along the banks of the Snake River Gorge, a nice isolated site with, with ample irrigation water. Uh, talking again about ornamentals, the, uh, the Ornamental Plant Germplasm Center in, in Columbus, Ohio, showing some materials, and the Woody Landscape Plant effort at the U.S. National Arboretum. One of my favorite gene banks, certainly one that has one of the incredible views, is, is the one in Palmer, Alaska in the Matanushka Valley. You, you walk out the, the back of the gene bank and look up and it's, oh my gosh, this is for, for uh, Arctic and subarctic materials, needless to say. So as, as I mentioned earlier, it, this is more, far more complicated than simply taking some seeds, putting them in the can, sticking it in the cold, and that's it. it it involves all these activities shown here. Rather than, than, walk, rather than uh, read through a litany of them, I'll give you some examples of all, all of this. So it's a complicated, multi-phase process. The first is exploration and, and acquisition. This is particularly important for the United States because with the exception of a few major crops, such as pecan, uh, which is uh, native to around here, or sunflower, most of our major crops originate somewhere else, somewhere else in the world. So here we see a wild pear species in the Republic of Georgia and the Caucasus and some of our plant explorers. This incidentally is a parent of an ornamental pear uh, variety, Silverbell, that Harold Pellet uh, released recently. So to conserve apple genetic diversity, our scientists at Geneva, New York, had to travel to the stands, to Kazakhstan, to Tajikistan, to Uzbekistan. And this is the, the part of the world where apple uh, originated. Its wild relative, Malus siversii, is found. Uh, we ran a, a number of expeditions there in the, in the 90s and the early 2000s. And as a result, we have a very fine apple uh, germplasm collection in Geneva, New York. But we also conduct some exploration within the United States. So uh, uh, recently, a group of our ornamental germplasm scientists conducted a, a, a fairly uh, extensive exploration for, for plants of ornamental uh, utility in the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. Now, the most expensive and most tedious part of, of this activity is maintaining and regenerating these materials. The bulk of the budget of a gene bank goes to this. And it's uh, planting the materials in the field, uh, erecting cages to protect them from cross-pollination, providing bees or flies to each, to each one of these cages is, is quite a labor-intensive uh, activity. Once the materials are regenerated and harvested, they're put in a controlled environment, generally uh, cold temperatures, such as this minus 5 Celsius cold room in Ames, Iowa. In our Fort Collins laboratory, some are in even, even far colder conditions, minus 18 Celsius. Some are in actually in liquid nitrogen, minus 155 or so. For some materials, uh, they cannot be conserved in cold or ultra cold. They have to be kept in living culture. And, and here we see some, uh, some pineapple clones that are being conserved in Hawaii in slow growth cultures in, in the uh, laboratory. Or as I showed you earlier, they can be conserved in pots and greenhouses or uh, out in field orchards. This is some rabbit eye uh, blueberry in uh, in uh, Corvallis, Oregon, in our gene bank there. So you have the cost of maintaining it when you re regenerate materials. Some of these materials require controlled pollination. You have to buy uh, uh, queen bees to, to start up an insect colony. It, it, this is just one of the needs that's, that contributes to a, a very costly uh, endeavor. 
Because you have so much genetic variability, there's, you're, only, you're quite limited to, to the degree to which you can standardize and, and, and use high throughput methods. Since you have so much variability in shape, size, behavior of, of, let's say, of seeds, there's a tremendous amount of hand labor involved still. Not only is the material maintained, but it's characterized or evaluated. It's evaluated for its horticultural potential in, in uh, controlled plantings. It's characterized genetically, uh, sometimes via some pretty uh, leading edge technology. So this is an example of a, a uh, analysis of variability at the level of a single, single nucleotide within some gene bank accessions of soybeans. So uh, currently, I'm I'll, I'll review some of the major challenges and opportunities with a particular focus on horticultural and ornamental genetic resources. One of the advantages of horticultural genetic resources, and in or ornamentals in particular, is that uh, comparatively speaking, they're pretty high value. Uh, low acreage, high value. Uh, and, and that means that to uh, quite a number of people, they are important, and, and it's, it's, some, it's easier, maybe easier to explain why we need to preserve them. This is a double-edged sword, though, because sometimes it's considered so valuable that uh, access to it would be restricted, and there's sometimes very good reason uh, to do that because of protecting intellectual property rights, protecting uh, investment, or in the case of certain, uh, certain countries, protecting what is viewed to be sovereign ownership rights. There's a demand for novelty. Those of you in the floricultural and nursery business uh, know that your product line is going to change dr dramatically over a five-year period, sometimes over a two- to three-year period, because the customer wants something novel. Well, you know, this is good uh, in terms of genetic diversity. It helps. Strengthens our rationale, strengthen our rationale for conserving the materials, but sometimes it, it, rather than having a, uh, a, uh, a pipeline for development, it might be more of a treadmill. So large uh, producers such as Monrovia, this is their location in, in Oregon, you can see just from the, this long-range view that uh, they, they grow a tremendous variety of materials. Uh, similarly, uh, the, the vegetable uh, aspects of the vegetable seed industry, such as Johnny Select Seed up in Maine, they're continually on the lookout for new materials, heirloom materials that they think their customers, uh, their customers or organic producers would, would like. So these, these uh, industry people are some of our most important customers and stakeholders. With ornamentals, we have a challenge of what I would term legacy collections. These are, are collections that were assembled because the flower looked pretty to somebody. It, it's on an aesthetic basis rather than on a genetic basis. Maybe small samples. Sometimes the information is, is, is suspect. So one of the challenges of our curators is how do you deal with this material? How do you preserve it? You know, what amount of it should be preserved? What amount of it needs to just be uh, allowed to, to be discarded because it doesn't add much to a collection. Another challenge for our curators are crops where there are multiple uses. So I mentioned allium. You have some allium that are ornamentals. You have some that actually may have some medicinal properties, especially in other nations. You have, uh, you have onions, scallions, leeks, you name it. So when you have an allium collection and you have one dollar, let's say, to, to use to, to curate it, which of these t many different types of crops within that one genus is going to have the priority? This is, uh, this is quite a challenge. An opportunity, more than the challenge, is shared technology. And uh, this is uh, a study we did about 10 years ago of the, the, the genus of sunflowers, Helianthus. What I want to, to highlight is we use the same genetic marker technology to look at wild sunflowers, elite uh, materials, oil seed materials, confectionery, that's sunflowers you eat out of the hand, oil seeds. And you can see we also used it to analyze ornamental sunflowers, such as these that are uh, uh, shown growing at the Johnny Select Research Site in, in Maine. 
So that's a, that's a re real opportunity. Another challenge and opportunity, especially for ornamental or high resolution images, uh, for our, our users, it's wonderful to be able to go to GRIN or other databases and, and to see a, a color high resolution photograph. Uh, for ornamentals, a picture is really worth more than a thousand words. But managing these on the internet, uploading them to the database, having the sufficient storage space to, to, to maintain it, being able to deliver it, can be challenging. To deal with, uh, with ornamentals, what we're evolving is a network of, of gardens and arboreta together with ARS uh, facilities to try to handle the more than 1,500 genera that are important in the woody landscape trade, the hundreds of genera that are important in the floricultural trade. We don't have the resources for us to do it all. So we, we partner under the umbrella of the North American Plant Collections Consortium with, uh, with uh, institutions like the Morton Arboretum, which has a tremendous uh, uh, collection of elms. Rather than try to duplicate this, we're trying to put it into a common database and, and share it. So that's a bit about the uh, current status. I'll now turn to future prospects uh, and try to give you some uh, idea of the direction we're headed. Uh, I could be very trite here and say that in germplasm we're at a crossroads. Uh, I assure you this isn't a Photoshop trick here. Uh, a road that runs by our, our large rice uh, research facility in Stuttgart, Arkansas, the director, a uh, former director, Neil Rutger, was able to convince the city administration to, to name the, uh, the, the road Germplasm Lane. So if you go to Stuttgart, Arkansas, you actually would see this. So what's involved here is forecasting the future. So there's various ways to do this. One of our, uh, our founding fathers said, you, you have to look at the past to forecast the future. A, uh, one of the prime ministers or one of the high ministers of the Great Britain at the same time said, forget about the past, it's not gonna help you. I'm, I'm more sympathetic to the view of Albert Einstein. If you're busy, you don't worry about it, the future's already here. And in, in, in some, uh, uh, in some uh, cases that I'll show here, you'll see that it, it really is. But here are some likely trends. Given, uh, you know, if you follow the, if you follow the, uh, the news, you, you know that uh, our country has many demands on its budgets. Uh, security, uh, fighting wars, uh, health uh, care, uh, highways, whatever. So the, the budget for gene banks uh, very likely will be static in the, in the near future. We hope that it increases through time, but in the near future, probably static. But the cost of managing these materials is, is increasing. As I mentioned, it's labor intensive, and, and, and labor is, is certainly an input that is increasing in cost. The price of gasoline, the price of fertilizer is increasing. Is increasing. The collections aren't shrinking, they're growing. Uh, because there's, there's more and more demand for these materials with, with each, uh, each day. And fortunately, there are some remarkable technical, technological advances that I'll outline that may help. Well, static budgets, uh, here's some data. Starting in about fiscal year 96, uh, our budget for gene banks, plant gene banks is about 20 million. We fortunately went under, underwent a, uh, a period of considerable growth, uh, but in the last few fiscal years, it's, it's uh, be, been more or less static. Uh, the 07, 08 is essentially the same as the 06. And if you've got a static budget and incre increasing the demand, who's gonna get the priority? Is it going to be uh, ornamentals or is it gonna be a critical food crop? These are our issues that we uh, wrestle with. Uh, as I mentioned, it's, uh, it's increasingly costly. And, then, and it's not very sexy either, as, as Kurt Vonnegut uh, indicated in, in this quote, is that everyone wants to build and no one wants to do the maintenance. So you see some of our crack, uh, our crack uh, ARS curators all looking for somebody else to stick their fingers in this mushy cucurbit uh, fruit and pull out the seeds. Uh, it, it, it can be uh, a bit tedious and a bit dirty at times. 
Technology can, can help, but, but initially the cost might be quite daunting for adapting uh, some of the, the new uh, um, uh, microarray technology that can help us genotype materials very rapidly. As I mentioned, we forecast, it's not difficult to forecast this, that we're going to conserve and distribute more and more horticultural materials. Many of our gene banks uh, that maintain horticultural materials, the last five years set records every year for distribution. Uh, so the materials uh, are proving to be more popular rather than less popular. In the early 90s, there were some scientists that were forecasting that the uh, the uh, biotechnology would uh, result in the lack of, of need for this genetic diversity. Well, now, here we are 15 years later, and, and some of our most frequent users are genome scientists or biotechnology scientists. And not only are they using it, they're generating incredible amounts of genetic stock using transposon knockout uh, uh, technologies. They're generating mutants by the tens of thousands and we have the responsibility for taking care of them. So again, our, our gene banks, such as that of Corvallis, that manage pairs, are seeing annual records each year uh, for uh, distributions of, of pear germplasm. And one of the reasons is that access to the material that we have is easier. The GRIN database is more complete. It's easier uh, since 1994 or so. People can tap into the internet. And, and know what we have and how to order it. We now have Federal Express, UPS, that, that can deliver it to you uh, nearly everywhere in the world. As a result, the distribution rate has grown. And, and some of our colleagues in the Economic Research Service, uh, through questionnaires, estimate that's continued to grow. And the, and the area of most growth is going to be developing countries. China, India, Brazil, that are dramatically increasing their investment in agricultural research. And they come to us for materials. So I, I know a few of you were, were out at the, uh, the International Horticultural Congress in Seoul, Korea two years ago. I was there too and saw just the incredible interest in Korea in horticulture. They're investing dramatic amounts of money there. But there are some issues, some problems here, too, in that the access is not a two-way street, unfortunately. We're finding it more and more difficult to gain access to material in other countries. It's, that's a complicated issue. There's a variety of reasons for that. But you can see here that prior to about 1998, when we'd asked to mount an expedition in another country, it would be, yeah, fine, no problem. And then we started being denied permission or uh, we were being granted permission, but the conditions we would have had to accept were just not reasonable, so it was as good as saying, no, you can't come in. At present, for every new sample we bring into, from another country into our gene bank, we ship out six. So this is a pretty good balance of trade with the rest of the world. I would argue that this benefits us over the long term because a lot of countries look at this and they say, you know, in terms of, of what the United States is doing with their gene banks, they're, they're the folks with the white hat and, and the riding the white horse, and we need to continue to provide them access. And some countries are, are, are acting that way. We have an international treaty that I can't discuss in great length here, uh, under the auspices of the FAO that hopefully is going to uh, enable better access of food crops. And uh, there's been some concern that more and more materials are being, are being protected in the United States by plant patents, by utility patents, by plant variety protection certificates. But it's often not uh, emphasized in these discussions is that these patents have a limited duration. 18 to 20 years. And once the patent expires, that material is, is in the public domain. And we're seeing more and more of these materials coming into our gene banks, and boy, are they popular. There's, uh, in maize, for example, some of these formerly 
protected inbred lines go out the door as rapidly as we can uh, ship them. So in, in that sense, our patent, our system of IPR in the United States seems to be working. It's providing an incentive for research. And at the end of the day, after a 20-year period, the material is, is getting out. So I talked about the increasing demand and a static budget. So you can forecast this mismatch uh, as happened to, to this, uh, this poor, uh, poor animal here. I would, I, would, uh, I would wager that some of our curators <laughs> some days feel this way, where they have this huge demand for their materials and uh, perhaps not enough horsepower to, uh, to handle the demand. So one of the ways that we're going to try to deal with this in the future is to reemphasize our international partnerships. For example, uh, a source of the raw material of chocolate, cacao, is very important for our, our uh, national confectionery industry. And they've been supporting us, partnering with other countries to conserve uh, chocolate, cacao genetic resources. I talked, uh, I mentioned I'd discuss a little bit about technological advances. Some of this has to do with information management, uh, which is so much easier these days. One of our, our, our strawberry curator in Oregon, in a matter of a few hours' time, used a Google Map to, uh, to map uh, geographically very precisely all the collections of strawberry that we hold in Corvallis. Five years ago, 10 years ago, this wouldn't exist. I want to talk in a little bit more detail on a research project we're doing uh, internally in ARS on the, uh, on the grape. Grape is very important to the U.S., not only for raisins and table grapes and grape juice, but also, of course, the wine industry is, is, has a major impact uh, on our national horticultural economy. What we're constructing is what we're calling a, a national gra uh, grape genetic trait index, and it's combining some new high-throughput genetic sequencing with, uh, with some information management tools to provide a, uh, uh, access to genetic variability information that will uh, enable our curators to do a much better job and will also enable great breeders to make accelerated progress. So here's a, 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 um, a schematic of how it's going to work. We're going to focus on nine particular wine grape varieties, a group of uh, wild grape uh, Species, we're going to extract the DNA, process it via restriction enzymes, do some preliminary sequencing, generate a whole load of, of sequences. And what we're looking for is variability at the nucleotide level. I showed you that slide of the soybean, um, what's called electropherogram. We're looking for what are called single nucleotide polymorphisms. This is taking research, this is taking technology that was developed initially for the, from human genetics, applying it to uh, a specialty crop, a horticultural crop. Then once we've chosen about 10,000 of these markers that we think are high quality, we're going to put them on a genotyping array, and we're going to genotype every sample in our gene bank collection, all 2,300 of them. So if you multiply 10K by 2,300, we're going to wind up having a total of 23 million data points that will help us to manage our gene banks and will help our, uh, help our, uh, and the whole public and private sector with uh, grape genetic improvement. Well, how do you manage those data? In parallel with this work, we're, we, are, uh, you, we are adapting information management technology that was developed for grain crops such as rice and maize and sorghum. And you can see we've got uh, grapes up there now. This is going to be available on the web at the end of this month. You can't find it right now, but it's nearly ready for prime time. So you'll see something like this, the chromosomes of grape, and they'll be populated with, with uh, genetic loci. Uh, this complicated uh, activity 
it can be summarized this way. It's, it's, it's using what we know about other plants, in this case a model plant called Arabidopsis, to help us know more very efficiently about grape. It's looking at what we know about a particular gene in this model plant and seeing if we can't find the same gene in grape and trying to figure out whether it has the same function. So you perhaps can see here is that we're, we are comparing the genetic sequence uh, in grape vitis vinifera uh, to that of this uh, Arabidopsis model plant. Well, that... Uh, was a, a panoramic uh, view of horticulture genetic resources with a focus on, uh, on ornamentals. I've, I've listed here uh, in your handout a variety of references you can, uh, that may be useful to you. I, I uh, outlined or highlighted in, in purple this one by our, one of our gene bank curators, Kim Hummer and Corvallis, because it's the proceeding of an entire symposium on this topic that was held in, uh, in Korea in 2006. Lastly, I'd like to, like to thank my host, Charlie Hall, for uh, the invitation uh, to present the uh, seminar, the Ellison family for being so generous to public sector research. There are very few public sector entities, especially families, that have been that generous, and they deserve all of our thanks. My colleagues in the National Plant Germplasm System, some of whom are sitting out here who do the, the most important work every, every day for sh sharing their slides and I ideas. Also would like to, uh, to uh, introduce, at least uh, remotely, two of my colleagues that have been on the job now uh, for 18 months. Sally Schneider, uh, who, who comes to the national program staff from Parlier, California. Gail Whistler who was the head of the Department of Plant Pathology at the University of Florida and is now on the national program staff. It used to be just me trying to hold down the entire horticulture burden for our national program staff, and now we've got two excellent uh, new national program leaders who will be happy to, to confer with you about any issues you have with horticultural genetic resources or horticulture in general. And with that, I've kept it... Under an hour, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs>well, the, the, the Farm Bill, of course, is authorizing legislation rather than appropriations. But what is different about this Farm Bill, that if it were passed today, it would uh, contain language that would, would uh, result in an allocation of tens of millions of dollars of what's called mandatory funding. And there's two major uh, pieces to that. One is bioenergy, and that will benefit our our sorghum colleagues and our maize colleagues and uh, the other especially crops. And that covers uh, essentially all the horticultural crops that don't have a program in place. So you have some horticultural crops like peas and lentils uh, or, or that are already program crops. They would not be included, but it would include all the fruit crops, all the other vegetable crops, all the ornamentals. So potentially, if, if that were passed in its current form, there would be mandatory, so-called mandatory rather than discretionary funding uh, available for, uh, for uh, horticultural uh, research, uh, specifically ornamentals. What the chances are of that happening, uh, my crystal ball is as cloudy as yours. I, I really don't know where that's going, nor will it go anywhere before the election. But certainly, at the very, at the minimum, it's put a, it's, it's elevated the visibility of specialty crops and put a, a major marker down. 
Now, whether anything in the way of dollars and cents comes out of this, I don't know. Way up in the back, yeah. Yes, uh, and it's already happened. Uh, many of the, uh, Ande the, the countries in the Andes, the Andean PAC countries, have in place legislation that makes it very difficult to, uh, to exchange materials with them. But these countries have signed on to this FAO International Treaty, and that international legislation trumps local and regional, regional legislation. So for, for the, the crops covered by that treaty, they are obligated to provide access to them, whereas the Andean Pact legislation would, would put that, as you phrased it, uh, iron curtain in place. So I, I guess I'm cautiously optimistic. Do I think we'll ever return to the era of free exchange very informally, a handshake? No, it's not going to happen. It's, it's always going to be more formal, and it's going to be more complicated and difficult. But this, the, the uh, development of this international treaty is, I think, a positive rather than a negative sign. Yes, Jim. Peter, uh, you mentioned the 75% redundancy of the Western. Mm -hmm. Was there any effort to remain the Yeah, the, the, re, the redundancy was, was from one national gene bank to another national gene bank. So within our national plant germplasm system, we don't have that level of redundancy. But if you look, for example, at India's gene bank and what they have in the way of sorghum, and you look at what we have in our gene bank in the way of the, in sorghum, and you look at the identification numbers, you realize that we've been trading stuff back and forth, and it's a tremendous amount of redundancy. That isn't necessarily bad in terms of security. So if, 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 if something's lost from the U.S. or something lost from India, then presumably someone else has it. But where you see the same, the same uh, accession occurring in 10 different gene banks, is that a good use of resources? It probably isn't. And one of the ways that the international community is dealing with this, as I made reference to the Global Crop Diversity Trust, which is an international organization that's accumulating a $260 million endowment. They've, they're past $100 million now. The Gates Foundation recently, recently granted them $30 million. They built, helped build that uh, Svalbard facility. They're going throughout, especially the developing world, and saying, we will help you maintain your gene bank, we'll help pay for it in perpetuity via our endowment. But we are not going to pay to conserve the same sample in country A that we know is in country B. So you've got to get together and you've got to declare which collection is going to have priority. Because when they started this, they saw some countries beginning to order everything they could from the U.S and say, oh, look, we've got this huge new gene bank that we need your help to conserve. And they said, hey, we're not that stupid. We know, we know that you've just bailed in essentially a duplicate of the U.S. collection. We're not going to pay you to conserve what we know that the U.S. is conserving and is making available. If you've got something unique and you're going to make it available to the world community, we're here. But we're not in the business of of, uh, of uh, causing more redundancy than there already is. So that's one way that we're trying to deal with it on an international basis. Some redundancy is important for security, but where you have that level of redundancy, uh, it's, you're really not using resources efficiently. And the level of redundancy within the U.S. collection is nowhere near that, that high within the collection. But if you compare some of what we have with what some other collections 
worldwide, yeah, you see quite a bit. 